You are listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. This week, I'm joined by Ziva Bellel, an American career coach based in Paris for over two decades. She's here to discuss one of my favorite false friends that's far more linked to pleasure than it is to profit. Profiter. All right. Welcome, Ziva, to the podcast. Ziva, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do here in France? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for having me on the show. I am a New Yorker from birth. I grew up in Brooklyn and moved to Paris in 1999. 1999 and actually, today is my 23rd uh, year anniversary living in France. Oh wow! Happy anniversary! Thank you. I love to. I yeah. It's a it's a it's a very important day. The day I arrived yesterday was the day I left. So today I'm more leaning into the French the French vibe. So 23 years ago today I arrived in France and I have not left since. And I've worn many professional hats since I moved to Paris. I first was a freelance journalist. I was then the director of marketing for Yelp for seven years. And at the end of 2016, Yelp had a very big company layoff and myself and 200 of my colleagues, we were um, we were fired on a conference call. And Fun. Yes. You know, kind of like the way you see it in the movies. And um, and that was a big chunk of my life. That had been seven years where I was managing a very exciting group of people who were spread out throughout Europe. And um, it was a real kind of moment of taking a look in, at my life and my professional choices and deciding what I wanted to do next, having somewhat of blank slate in front of me. And I decided to explore something I had been curious about, which was coaching. When I first arrived in Paris, I had, you know, fantasized about becoming a psychologist because I had had a very interesting experience in New York prior to moving to Paris, thanks to therapy. And I thought that that was just such a, a neat profession. And I tried to get into the French university here and I did not pass the written exams. So I, I had to put that on the, you know, on the side burner for a while. And I became a journalist. And in my mind, that was almost as good as being a psychologist because you get to ask a lot of questions. But eventually, after being laid off from Yelp, I had this opportunity to really think about different choices and career paths and what I really wanted to be doing with my life. And so coaching was something that I had heard about as a way of you know, bringing out the potential and people and really having them construct their lives in a more thoughtful and strategic way based on, you know, their values and some of their hidden desires. And so that really resonated with me. And I, I got um, certified to become a coach. And so I started my coaching practice in 2018. And I decided that I was going to work exclusively f- with women which was a choice that kind of came out quite naturally as I was getting my certification. I just realized I was very impassioned by the idea of helping women deconstruct some of the societal and cultural expectations and really tap into the things that motivate them and that they want to kind of develop and and bring into the world. So that was the decision. And so I've been doing that now since 2018. And it's the most fulfilling job I've ever had. And that's amazing. And I think that your story, but also your current career, position you quite perfectly to talk about the word that I wanted us to address today, which is profiter. So profiter is spelled as though it is a you know direct translation of profit. But as you know, you and I both know, I mean, you've been here even longer than I have, but after a long time of learning French, you begin to learn that there are words that are false friends. And profiter, I think, is one of the falsest friends because while it has that root profit in it, 
it definitely means something else in French. So if you had to just give like a base translation of profiter, how would you, tr you know, translate that into English? Yeah, I think it's, it's, I agree. It's a fascinating false friend. If I had to translate it, you know, literally into English, it would be to profit from in to, or to take advantage of. It's usually used in, I would think, in those, in those two, in those two ways. However, that is not at all the way that it's used in common French vernacular. So, you know, the actual technical translation makes it sound very transactional, almost as if you've, you know, you've put some, you've, you have an investment portfolio and you decide that you're going to sell some stocks in order to profit from the, you know, the increase in value. And that's exactly not what it means in French. In French, I find that it's often used for intangibles in our lives. So it's kind of the opposite. It's not really quite concrete. People say they want to profiter from vacations, times with their friends, moments on a terrasse, an apéro with, uh, with, you know, with some people that they haven't seen in a long time. So the way that it's used in French typically is it's more of a allusion to being present and enjoying the experience that you have that is almost like a just a common experience that's full of joy and it's full of beauty, it's full of friendship, and you want to be fully conscious of the fact that you're having that experience. And so by saying like profiter of that moment, it's really focusing your attention on on how that moment of time is is quite precious. Yeah, and I think what you were saying about, you know, profiter of vacation, like I think I th hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, if it's a beautiful day in Paris, which isn't all which you know, contrary to what a lot of people think, isn't necessarily the all the way that Paris always is. We we have London's weather, so you know, you have a beautiful day in late March and you're like, "Oh, Let's profiter. Let's, you know, skive off of what we planned on doing and just sit on a terrace and have a drink. And so you can profiter du beau temps. So you can profit of, like, take advantage of something. But you can also, like, I've heard people, you know, sitting on the beach and it's like, oh, like, what do you want to do today? It's like nothing. Let's just profit. Like, let's just, like, and it's, it's not hang out and it's not take advantage of. You can actually almost you know, just be, like you said, in this intangible space of kind of joyful moments. Mm -hmm. It's almost, a, I, you know, a lot of times people now in, in a spiritual, I will say like, you know, have like, like plein présence, be fully present for that moment that you're having. And that is the, it's, it's, it's almost like before it's time the term profiter, because now that's something that people say quite casually, like, you know, to be present in that moment. But profiter, I think, is a term that's been around for a long time. And it's it's really, it's that ability to take stock of how you are, give, you have an opportunity to do something that is pleasant and um, joyful and has value. And maybe that's the association a little bit to like to benefit from, to profit from, because it's those intangible moments that actually have huge value in our lives that we have a tendency to overlook. Absolutely. And I think this is one of those things where, you know, probably one of the reasons that a lot of people are listening to this podcast is, you know, Francophiles, there's this sort of almost magical paintbrush with which we paint the French uh, philosophy and mindset. And we, you know, we tell ourselves, oh, you know, the French really know how to do certain things, you know, raise children, eat a lot of cheese without getting fat, you know. And I think, you know, as we've broken down over several seasons on this podcast, some of those things are more true than others. I do think that like the French tend to have an easier time naturally being in the present moment maybe than Americans tend to. I remember I had a French teacher um, when I first moved here who said, oh, you know, the French are governed by the verb être, to be, and the French, you, I mean, you Americans, you're, you're governed by avoir or faire, so to have or to do. But 
you know, we, we've talked on this podcast here about the French relationship to work and to vacation, but I do think that your coaching and your kind of the insight that you're bringing to a lot of French women right now has to do a little bit with the fact that while the French are very good at profiting of a <laughs> vacation or a beautiful moment, for some people that isn't where they want this you know, fulfillment, or I think you speak a lot about the word épanouissement, which I think can sort of be translated as fulfillment. They want their fulfillment to come from something other than just those moments of pure joy. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a really fascinating kind of paradigm shift that's occurring here that I've been given a front row seat to because of what my clients are coming to me looking for in their lives. And it does somehow topple the stereotypes that we have around the French really being able to compartmentalize work and play. This idea that, you know, they can, you know, they could be energized and, and efficient during the day and get their work done, but it's really in order to uh, work to play. So eventually to have those moments on the terrace, to have those moments where you're on vacation, you know, there's a lot of vacation packed into a year. Every six weeks, there is a school break. So this is something that's often uh, news to Americans is that if you have children every six weeks, they have two weeks vacation and you have to think about what you're going to do with them. Um, and often you take a week off to to be with your your family. So there's a regular cadence of work and play baked into the structure of life here. And maybe you, you know, one would say like that's that's quite that's quite balanced and satisfying. And you know, why look for anything more than that? But what I'm seeing happen in the requests that I'm getting from the women that I'm working with is that it's not enough to just profiter on the weekends and during vacations. There's a desire to feel more fulfillment and more purpose and more impact in those hours that over you know weeks and months and years turn out to be quite substantial in terms of the time that we spend doing the work that we do. And so I have clients who are coming in who are saying, okay, well, I have a career that on paper is satisfying and you know I have a certain amount of stability and security which is a big value here in France you know uh, it used to be that just once you get a job that has a certain salary and that it has a you know a city which is the kind of promised land of security because you can't get fired unless something you know really unexpected happens so it's like you get a CDE and you're just you're set until you're 65 and then you could retire. So even people who have that sense of security in their jobs are realizing that that is not enough. It's almost like a golden prison. People want to feel alive every day. So what they're coming looking for is an approach and a methodology that's going to help them connect to what makes them feel alive beyond just the profiter on the weekends, beyond being able to take vacations and decompress. So it's the work that I'm doing is helping them articulate what are the ways in which they do feel alive and feel like they're providing value and they're feeling energized and like they're making an impact in the world. And then once we are able to ar identify and articulate what those ingredients are, then it's how can they bring that into the job that they're doing or perhaps create a whole new uh, professional path for themselves. So the focus is leaning less towards security during the day and, you know, profiter whenever there are pauses between work and more how to bring that sense of fulfillment and purpose and pleasure into every aspect of their lives, including their professional lives. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Heart of You, where expert Annette talks manifesting, tarot, and so much more. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. 
So I find this so fascinating. And as a, a fellow native New Yorker and, you know, ambitious person and self-employed person, I feel like when I first moved to France, one of the only things that I found, well, not one of the only things, but one of the hardest things that I found in integrating with French society was that I would go to a party and sometimes I'd be at a party with my colleagues. And if I brought up something to do with work, they'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. It's the weekend. We're, we're, we're profiting. We're taking advantage. We're not talking about work on a Saturday. But the problem is that I love my work and I've always loved my work. But of course, as an American, and I am, I have been living in France for 15 years, but as an American, and I think probably also because by virtue of the fact that I'm self-employed, I work way too much. And I know that. And I'm trying to in, infuse my life with more balance. But it feels like, you know, something that Americans are retconning into our lives, where it's, it's something that pre-exists in French lives, as you've, as you've, you know, explored so well. So do you get the sense that in seeking employment that's more fulfilling, there's any risk to the same extent as, for example, when the French kind of moved away from the family meal structure and started snacking, we saw obesity is kind of starting to rise. Do you worry or do you sense that there might be more of that imbalance that we have in America with work where people work too much or people identify too strongly with their work? Or do you think that because of the way the, that French society is already set up, that's less of a worry here? Mm, that's a fascinating question. I think we've got a lot of wiggle room before we get to a dangerous tipping point. And I find what's maybe a little bit more difficult for, the, well, at least I, I can speak to the people who I've worked with, is that when you're exploring how to bring more fulfillment into your day and into your profession, that question is so incongruous with the way that the culture is set up to think about work, that the risk is actually ruffling a lot of feathers in your entourage. Because when you start to say, you know, I'm a lawyer and I've done really well, but I think I'm going to leave my profession because it just doesn't provide me with much fulfillment, people around you are going to get really scared. <laughs> scared because there's a shift in what is supposed to be enough for people to feel happy and fulfilled in their lives. And so if you have one person who starts questioning themselves and questioning the model, it really shifts things in the conversation and shifts things in a lot of relationships that people have. And so I we I think that there's a huge you know there's a huge amount that needs to happen before the whole model crumbles. But I think it's one person creating some kind of a ripple effect who's saying, "Well, you know, I am I'm inviting in some instability because I think it's going to be worth it because I'd rather have a job that I'm excited to talk about all the time." that is not going to be just something that I want to cloister off between, you know, nine and seven in my day. I want to be thinking about things that are important to me, even when I'm on, you know, when I'm on the beach with my, you know, with my family and my friends. It's almost like that is, in a way, the ultimate dream is to do something that is so enjoyable and so connected to your values and what you care about that Maybe you're not doing it during your off time, but you're thinking about it and you're nurturing this sense of, of movement and purpose, even when you're not, you know, clocked in. And longtime listeners of this podcast will have probably tuned into our episode on entrepreneur or our episode on travail. So you'll know a little bit about this sort of balance that we have in France. You, you alluded to it as well with the CDI and this desire the French have for stability more than fulfillment in their work, just sort of over the, you know, in the past, culturally, people uh, want this, you know, ironclad contract that gives them a certain amount of stability. We don't have a credit system here, for example. So like when you apply for an apartment, you don't show them your credit score. You literally show them your work contract that says that you essentially can't be fired unless you commit some sort of grievous, heinous offense. And with that sort of mindset of, well, work is for work and play is for play, and I'm going to take advantage of play, 
What do you see as being kind of the inciting factor or incident that's leading people to want something different? Where do you think this is coming from? Well, you alluded to, you know, maybe like maybe fast food American uh, culture making its way across the Atlantic and, you know, infiltrating uh, the culture here. And, you know, clearly there, there are consequences in terms of certain traditions and cultures being jolted by, by the American invasion of food. But I think that this shift is definitely uh, driven by maybe a self-help movement and a, and a personal development movement that was that originates in America, where people are thinking about, you know, the larger context and the purpose of living on this earth and on this planet and the amount of time that we have. These weren't necessarily questions that people were thinking about when they made their decisions about what they wanted to do professionally 30 years ago. But today, the women that I'm coaching are, you know, they're very cosmopolitan, they're reading blogs, they're listening to podcasts, they're, they're, you know, connecting to movements that are beyond the scope of just what's happening in France, or they're following people in France who are, you know, inspired by movements that are generated overseas. So I think it's really like, a, you know, a mashup of maybe thought leaders here, influencers here who are inspired by the American personal development movement, who are able to translate that in a way that makes sense and resonates with, uh, with French culture today. And a lot of the people that I work with are starting to, they're starting their reflection about purpose and fulfillment because they've started to feel different things in their body. And maybe this seems like a little bit of a, a kind of a leap conceptually, but what I'm noticing is that the people who decide that they want to feel more fulfillment and more joy and um, like they're really taking advantage of each day that they're alive professionally started that process through connecting with their body, maybe by doing meditation or by doing yoga or by, you know, doing some kind of movement that is helping them connect to feelings that they didn't think were important to um, to nurture. So they're starting to feel certain things in their body and they're like, wait, I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling joy. I'm feeling hopeful. I'm feeling optimistic. I'm feeling really good right now. Why is it when I stop doing this and I go to my job, I feel miserable? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's you know, there's there seems to be this real sharp contrast. Like I'm feeling confident and powerful and enthusiastic and vibrant. I'm connecting to my body. You know, I see progress. I'm I'm really kind of radiating joy. And then I show up at work and I feel small. I feel like I have no not, you know no, no purpose. I'm just going through the ropes. Every day is the same thing. I, I don't even know how I wound up here. A lot of times people say, I, I like I made all the, the decisions at some point and I don't even know who was calling the shots. It, it feels very disjointed and very disconnected. So I think that there is a relationship you feel, to feeling connected and more integrated in your body. And that has a lot to do with the personal development and mindfulness and um, maybe a certain kind of spiritual quest. And then saying, well, if I feel that way in my body, how can I bring that to other parts of my life too? And that's when they come to me is with this inkling that things could be better because they have something concrete that has shifted in their lives. And they say, well, if I can feel better in my body, how can I feel better in my, in my profession? I'm also very curious as well, you know, with your time and experience spent here, I feel as though Americans and New Yorkers are particularly bad with this. We feel like we need to wring purpose or productivity out of every single moment. And that includes our time off. So 
you know, when Americans are taking some time, it's like, well, I have to go work out or I have to clean my house or I have to volunteer or I have to, I have to, I have to, or I should. And I feel like the French are not necessarily governed by should quite so much, uh, especially in their time off. And, you know, even in their time on work, I feel like they, they have this sort of ingrained sense of their time being dictated by something else. And I, I mean, it's an intangible kind of, you know, I, I know I'm just sort of throwing stuff at you, but do you get this sense from having spoken to these women and understood what is making them feel dissatisfied with their professional life of sort of what governs a French person's desire to fill their time with something, with joy, with with these yeah. moments? Does that come from, you know, it's not should, it's not have to, but what do you think is is motivating them from the inside? Mm, that's fascinating. Well, I mean, I agree with some of what you're saying, but I also have a lot of kind of evidence to pick holes through that too. Please do. <laughs> um, but it's kind of like a yes and. There is a, well, first, the French have a lot of ingrained rules and obligations. The amount of time that I hear are, il faut que je devrais. Uh-huh. I it you know it it makes me want to like rip my eyes out. There are a lot of ingrained rules that are also written into just the language of how you express what you feel like you would want to do. So when often I hear like il faut que je devrais, which means like I need to or I have to, the question is who's speaking. Where is that coming from? Who says that you need to do that? And actually, I, the linguistics nerd in me is, I want to just highlight for anyone who doesn't speak French, that's so interesting because il faut que, it's, it's, it is necessary to, or like I have to, but there is no subject. So it, I mean, there is, but it's, an, it's a sort of vaporous, it doesn't, it, there's no one saying I have to, or I've been told I have to, or society says I have to. Il faut que has no agent of the sentence. So it's so fascinating. Please continue. Yeah. And so it's, you know, one of what we do in, in, in coaching is, is question the way that people think and, and make sense of their worlds to, to expose some of the blind spots in habitual thinking and habitual behaving and decision-making and taking action. So when I have clients who say, il faut que, ou je devrais, il faut mieux que, you know, we really have to explore where are these rules coming from? Who, who is calling the shots? Because a lot of the times people have gotten to the fact that they're sitting in front of me because they don't feel like they were the ones calling the shots. So there, there is a certain kind of almost intrinsic cultural dictate that is pushing people to maybe strive for certain expressions of excellence, you know, excellence in their career, excellence in their bodies, excellence in their personal choices, in their parenting, in their vacationing. <laughs> there is a sense of excellence that I think that is very ingrained in, in French culture. Maybe it's not the same as in America where it's about showiness and getting the recognition from the outside, uh, kind of like an upward curve of success. It's more these kind of benchmarks that people feel like they need to attain in order to continue to be pushing themselves and, and applying effort. It's a it's a society or culture that I I've started to understand more in how much effort and and hardship and almost pain in the work is really valued. So the harder it is, the more it seems that it's it's a uh, meritant, it's worthy. So like the harder the work, the more you know, the harder you can play or the the more you deserve the vacation. And that that is something that I really think has been influencing a lot of the women that I wind up working with who are, you know, high achieving, kind of bon élève, good students who have done everything right, who have proven themselves and put so much energy and effort 
into their into their choices and their careers and their families and their children and they just get to the point where you know they're pretty they're pretty beat up you know internally like they're pretty exhausted so part of it is unraveling that il faut que mentality because that is not always what is best for you and so it's really picking apart What is driving that belief that you have to do something in a particular way? Because that's usually how they've gotten away from what actually is true and, and resonates deeply with, with their beliefs and what they want for their lives. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Romancing in Paris, which delves into love, lust, and so much more in the city of light. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to navigating the French. And when you were saying that the this sort of this effort or you know pain through work, I mean that's something that I hear even just you know it's it's rare that you hear people say something positive about their job, and I don't necessarily think that's always because there's nothing positive about it. I think it's because culturally people complain about their work in France more than they say good things about it. Just, I mean, I think it's, a, as, as you said, kind of, it's a display that you are earning that time off. But the French, contrary to the Americans, do tend to take that time off and they do feel as though they've earned it. Do you feel as though that relationship between work and play is going to be sustained as we see this shift of people who are looking for more meaning and more épanouissement in their work? I don't know. It's it's a really interesting question. I mean, dismantling the connection between effort and value, I think is going to make some some kind of changes in the way that the people the way that people do think about their downtime. There is something very rigid there almost a certain kind of shame or embarrassment that if if you do enjoy what you do if it isn't too hard then is it really work and that's where i like this is where like miss america me <laughs> <laughs> like, this is where i have a really I fun like time. it <laughs> like i have a really fun fun time playing with that notion that you can't actually like what do you mean it's not really valuable if you're having a good time doing your work it's a kind of revolution in the way that they think about work that work can be enjoyable that work can be fulfilling that you can play you can like you know have your playlist on and be like dancing around the room and you know get good work done and it doesn't mean that you deserve any less of your personal time and your you know your independence your autonomy and your great paycheck so that's where i feel like i want to come in and really make a claim for like you can have that too you can have the you know the great results you could be doing amazing things in the world and you should be actually enjoying yourself because that's when you know that you're really in the right spot because I really do believe that when you're doing great work, it's because you're using the skills that you have that, qu that come really naturally to you. It's when you're not in your like, you know, your zone of brilliance that things get really wonky and you wind up, you know, pushing yourself too hard. You wind up stop listening to your body. You wind up like saying yes to things or, or continuing to like add on. Uh, accumulate responsibilities because you you think that's the way that you're going to prove your value. But when you start doing more of the things that come quite naturally to you, you can do those things better, and you can make a, a bigger impact, and you can actually have a fun, you know a pretty fun time. Totally. Well, Ziva, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It has been eye opening in the ways in which you know the French. Uh, relationship towards work and play is evolving and changing. And of course, this idea of profiter and taking advantage of, of joy. And, and I've just really enjoyed this conversation with you. I have one last question for you before I let you go. And that is, what is your favorite word in French? Oh, God. Why didn't you ask me earlier? Because <laughs> <laughs> this is how I do. 
I'm just going to throw this one out. I don't know if it's my favorite one, but it's just coming to me right now is Delice. Oh, I like that one. How do you like to use it? I don't use it enough, actually, I okay. realize. Like, but I, I think it's coming to me because I think that this conversation is a delice. It's like a real delight. It's a real like oh. delicious moment. So just one of those kind of like, you know, bite-sized delicious chunks that I appreciate being able to partake in. Amazing. Well, I appreciate it as well. And we are recording this on a Friday. I know that you're all listening on a Sunday, but I'm going to say have a good weekend and profite bien. Mm. Take advantage of your weekend. I hope that you have some beautiful weather, Paris, and that you can have an awesome bit of time off and thinking about all of the wonderful ways in which you are on and profiting of all of your skills in your coaching. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Emily, for having me. Thank you. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.